Hello and welcome to this talk called Using V-Ray to Meet Publication Deadlines. Thank you very much for having me. Just quickly to introduce myself and tell you a bit about my background. My name is Jake Denham and I am a CGI artist and mentor from the United Kingdom. I create images for press, web and marketing as well as teaching people from around the world how to use CGI and I am also really proud to be an official V-Ray mentor. I studied video game design at uni because who wouldn't want to do that? And then I used those skills to start creating images for Jet. And that was really before I knew that visualization was a thing. And this led me on to doing a master's in digital design at the University for Creative Arts. I then started working in the world of yacht visualization and that took me over to Monaco and the US to which I was lucky enough to work on and watch this yacht get built. Since then I have had the privilege to work with some really exciting brands and designers and expanded to all types of work for the architectural industry and beyond that that now includes automotive, travel illustration, advertising and really any kind of project that uses computer generated images. Today we're going to be talking about when and how 3ds Max can be used alongside photography in advertising campaigns. So if you're a CGI artist looking to create images for press this talk will hopefully be useful and if you're a creative or a photographer and agency looking into the possibilities of CGI, then this is a great place to begin exploring what's possible. It's really important to note that I'm showing how I use these tools and there are many ways to use CGI and this is just a way I have found that currently works for me. And I really hope it helps you to create awesome CGI's as well. Throughout this talk, I'm going to be referencing two real world campaigns in particular and exploring how CGI made them possible. The first campaign we'll talk about is this project on screen. It was created for Grundig and the Sunday Times alongside Bridge Studios and Boulder Creative. This project incorporated real world models into a virtual environment and I'll go over the reasons why a virtual environment was chosen in a moment. After looking at merging real into the virtual, we'll take a look at merging the virtual into the real world and we'll explore this car ad that was created for Kia and Bridge Studios and this was a good example of using a specific real world location without having access to the product. So if this sounds interesting to you, let's get into it. The projects we'll look at today have been chosen as they represent two common photo shoots. Another common use of CGI is a product shot, which we can see on the left, and this is full CGI in a virtual studio, and this type of image doesn't require any photography. Whereas a lifestyle shot can use a physical environment or a product that integrates with CGI. So it's really physical meets virtual to produce an image. Grundig wanted to get influencers to design their dream kitchen for a campaign that would run in the Sunday Times over the course of a month with a different image each week. So Bridge Studio invited four influencers from the world of interior design, food, fashion and architecture to design their dream kitchens. And then Bridge interviewed each influencer and sketched up their dream kitchens and I worked with Boulder Creative on this project to turn these dream kitchens into a reality. So these were the initial sketches that came from the interviews. Now each of these briefs were pretty detailed and they didn't leave much to the imagination. The briefs detailed exterior views, window specifications, plants, flooring, all the way down to the books on the bookshelf. So the problem was to find a location that matched the spec would have been really difficult and constructing the kitchens was an option but sourcing and constructing each kitchen wouldn't have been possible within the time frame. 
What did prove to be a good approach was to build a freely kitchen and then use physical photography to place our influencer into the image. CGI can offer faster turnaround times on creating marketing material than photo shoots. And one reason for this is there is no need to ship physical products. Taking a look at the product list really highlighted this. This product list included ovens, fridges, washing machines and dishwashers. Shipping all of these products would have been costly for the budget and the time frame. And not only that, it would have had an environmental impact as well. Ultimately, using CGI meant that the publication deadline for each image could be hit within the timeframes. As soon as I received the brief, I began creating the sets within 3ds Max. And something that's great about virtual sets is that they can be created before the photo shoot. So this obviously eliminates any set construction time that I mentioned. And it also means that the director can start working out camera angles and lighting before the shoot. And it also gives us the opportunity to pose the model and play with lighting before they even arrive on set. And having all of this prepared minimizes the studio time needed and leads to a much more streamlined photo shoot for both models and crew. It also alleviates some of that pressure of everything happening at once on the day of the shoot. Another thing about shooting a virtual set was it didn't need to be finalized before the day of the shoot. So products and materials could be continued to be developed from the start all the way up until the print date. This 360 is from the full shoot we did at Bridge Studio. On the day of the shoot, the lighting was set up to mimic the virtual set. Again, having a pretty good idea of what we wanted before heading into the studio saved everyone involved buckets of time. And this can work both ways, whether you're lighting the CGI to the photography or matching the photography lighting to the CGI. Interactive rendering and light mix are incredible. Using interactive render meant we could play with a camera and the lighting live on set. If the photographer wanted to change the lighting on the model, we could easily update it in the CGI. Using tools such as Lightmix also gave us the ability to play with light scenarios. So there was an idea to try a night shot, and this was so easy to set up on our site by just switching off a few lights. And here's that happening very quickly. Being on set and seeing things live meant we could pick up on things that we could have missed without the virtual set. A good example of this was the glass in the background. When previewing the night shot, we realized that the reflections had become much more prominent. So for this specific shot, we placed a mirror behind our model to catch the reflection. This could then be added to the final image if it was chosen. Lightmix is really easy to set up in V-Ray and you just need to head over to the render setup and under render elements, add the V-Ray Lightmix render element. And now when you render, you'll get a list of lights in the bottom right of your frame buffer and you'll be able to change the power and the color of them. Lighting a scene now can be as quick as placing lights where there'll be lights and then just using Lightmix. It's well worth naming your lights if you're going to use a lot of them. I really think that Lightmix is one of the most impactful tools that I have used recently to improve my workflow and I highly recommend you check it out. Working in a virtual environment allowed me to change materials on the fly. Originally the floor in this image was wood and the decision was made to change it to concrete. This change was possible very quickly in CGI, and I wouldn't even want to imagine how long it would have taken on a physical set. Even if it was to be done in post, having the virtual set allowed the director to see everything come together and test out any other ideas. The addition of the material library and presets to V-Ray 5 has made this a breeze. Making quick changes on set is easy with the asset browser, 
And if the materials need refining later on, that's great. But having this set of high quality pre-made materials, again, is a massive time saver. So you can access this V-Ray asset browser from the V-Ray toolbar. You can see it in the bottom left and it comes with tons of materials. And also now in the material editor, if you create a V-Ray material, you'll see the preset drop down. And this is a great place to get started on your materials as well. Creating the kitchens in 3ds Max also meant that the cameras were not constrained by real world physics. Using virtual cameras can add more creative freedom, especially on interior shots where a photographer can be limited to a wide angle lens dictated by the room dimensions. Camera clipping is a major benefit of virtual sets and allows the exclusion of certain geometry. For example, if this was a physical set, the wall is about as far back as you could get before you might consider using a wider lens. In 3ds Max, you can enable camera clipping in the camera settings and this will allow us behind the wall. You could hide the wall from the view altogether, but that's going to impact our lighting as well as give us unrealistic shadows and reflections. And here's a video example of that happening. So we've got a camera behind the wall. And if I turn off clipping, you'll see all we can see is that wall. And when we turn it on, you'll see in the top right viewport, a red line across and that is showing what's going to be excluded from the camera and using the controls you can pull that in and out and here's another example of making reflections physically accurate in the second shoot initially the set behind the camera was empty other than the back wall and you can see here i put in some furniture and some pictures and it's just really important to build a full CGI environment, even if it's just for the reflections in the mixer, as this can add that extra 1% of realism. Once we had the model shot, we could get the final renders completed and the model integrated into the scene. And merging the model into the render was made much easier because the lighting of the model and the lighting of the scene were very closely matched. For one of our kitchens, the model was seating and the bar stool had been specified in the brief and we did manage to source this stool in real life. We also created a digital version and this really aided us in incorporating it into the images. So here is the original sketch versus the final image. And this is the final double page spread that went to print. The images were also going to be used digitally. And another part of the project was to create a making of video to be used online. So here's that video. There was an emphasis on the kitchen getting built up and part of this was having each light switch on. And this is another great use of light mix. I could render the scene with a material override on and then using light mix I could save out each light scenario individually. And without light mix I would have had to render each light scenario individually 
and this is something I obviously didn't want to do, especially with the deadline looming. Three DS Max and V Ray ultimately enabled a photo shoot that would not have been otherwise possible. Using these tools allowed us to create the dream kitchens without needing to source a set or product. And this meant that we saved time and cost on building the sets as well as the environmental impact on shipping. Pre-constructing our sets in 3D allowed us to choose our angles and lighting before getting into the studio and it allowed us to develop the look all the way up until the print date. Here are the other three briefs versus their final images. And finally, regarding this project, this was a massive team effort by Bridge Studio, Boulder Creative and Amit Lennon, who was the photographer. In this next project, I want to cover using a physical location and merging in a digital product. Kia and Bridge Studios wanted to create a double page spread in the Sunday Times magazine for the release of Kia's e Nero. The car was to be located in Whiteley Wind Farm in Scotland. Whiteley was significant because it is the biggest onshore wind farm in the UK and this made it the perfect backdrop for Kia's electric car. The problem was at the time there were very few if any Kia e Neros in the country and this meant quite a few challenges to overcome. Getting access to the car was going to be very difficult and if we did manage to get access to the car we'd need to get it to Scotland and we were all based in London. Once we'd got the car to Scotland we'd be at the mercy of the weather for the limited time frame we had access to the car and the wind farm. The solution was to go ahead with the photo shoot, but this time with a digital version of the e Nero. And this would overcome some of the logistical challenges of sourcing and shipping. Weather dependency, especially in Scotland, location access, and also ease our worries about time frame. Because we didn't have the car on set for the shoot, it was really important that the team could get feedback with the digital asset in shot. Again, a beautiful thing about using 3D is being able to prepare. To allow this feedback to be as accurate as possible, I created an exterior environment in 3DS Max. And this scene contained the car, which is our digital asset, a shadow catcher to catch the shadows, uh, a virtual camera that was going to match the physical camera and also a dome light and a sun. A HDRI was going to be used in this dome light. HDRIs do a great job of replicating real world lighting, shadows and reflections. Just quickly, I imagine some of you know what a HDRI is, but for those of you that don't, HDRI is short for High Dynamic Range Image. They're shot in panoramic, so they're 360, and they can be used in 3D programs to illuminate a scene. I wanted to be able to quickly create a High Dynamic Range Image on set, so I took a Samsung Gear 360 with me, and the Samsung Gear 360 could shoot 360 images in one click. And this meant that I didn't have to worry about stitching 360 degree images together on set like I would have had to do if I had used a normal camera. So I took 360s at different exposures and as you can see in this example, 
some of the image is very dark and some is really overexposed and all of these images get combined into one 32-bit image containing all of that data. This means we get all of this information in the shadows as well as all of the information in the really bright areas. As the photographer is shooting the back plates, I can then quickly merge the 360 images into this HDRI and replace the placeholder within 3ds Max. And this helps to produce the lighting reflections and the shadows. Something to note is wind farms are windy and things move and propellers turn. So this really is worth noting if you're wanting to ever merge together images from a wind farm. Interactive rendering was again a massive help on this project. With our scene set up in 3ds Max plus interactive rendering, a live shoot could take place with art direction and set design in the virtual slash physical world. So this technique was used to explore a few other camera angles as well. And this was the shot we ultimately went with. During the shoot, we shot the back plates with and without a placeholder car. And although this wasn't necessary, it did help with scale and lighting for the CGI version. It it's handy to see where shadows are dropping and where highlights are going to be hitting the car. Once the shot had been decided, the final image was rendered and worked up with post effects and consideration for text placement. And here is the final layout that went to press. The Kia project demonstrates when a virtual product is placed into a physical environment and using 3ds Max and V-Ray this process can be very fluid and the feedback can be seen on set. So in this talk we have explored how we can merge virtual and physical worlds to overcome some bottlenecks of traditional photography. Due to the current climate it is becoming tougher to do physical shoots and we're seeing a huge shift from traditional photography and film to CGI. And CGI certainly isn't a magic bullet, but I'm excited to see the continued merging of these realities. I hope I've demonstrated to you some ways that CGI and photography can complement each other, saving both time and cost, and leaving you more time to focus on being creative and producing incredible work. If you want to find out more about what I do and get in touch with me, you can via any of these places on the internet. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. And uh, welcome back to the Q&A session. And uh, we're about to see him live, Jake Denham. I'm really happy to be uh, the moderator of, of this 3D Expo, just to see your work, because you're fabulous, Jake, especially when you described how you work. Uh, but just to start up, I saw a few laggings, uh, 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 so it might be a couple of cliffhangers uh, while doing this video. So is there something that you want to add? Um, I mean, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, hopefully some of you guys found that useful. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to answer anything uh, that uh, people might have missed. Uh, we do have questions from the audience and uh, one is uh, before the light mix feature in v5ray uh, describe the workaround to achieve the similar light control yeah sure it was it was much different uh, before the light mix in v-ray 5 um, and as i said i think this has been a, a really big game changer for everyone that uses v-ray 
um, and Corona before that as well. Um, before that, it was, uh, well, a few years ago would have been a case of putting your lights in, hitting render, seeing how that looks, try again. And it was a very repetitive task. Um, and then as interactive render got better and the feedback got quicker, you could do a similar thing with interactive render and the light lister, which basically lists your lights. And with interactive render, you could do a very similar thing to light mix there as well. Great. And I also noticed that you mentioned a few times that it's cost effective and the benefits of the cost when it comes to CGI. What are the costs for benefits for using CGI? Yeah, sure. I mean, compared to doing a photo shoot, hopefully I've highlighted a few points in there, but I think um, time was a major factor with the two week turnaround times for the kitchen products, mm -hmm. uh, projects, getting hold of all them products was going to be a, a task in itself and then to get them shipped over all of this costs money but the main thing as well is time and people's time studio time models um and then you've also got the shipping of people so if we had to get to the key issue um mm. set construction time mm. and also if there was changes such as during that shoot we went from a wooden floor to concrete and to do that on set um i mean that i wouldn't even want to begin <laughs> when the director says that what would even start to do there start tearing up the floor and, and concrete it um so yeah there's there's a few points there might be strange uh, questions since you like to be the creative person you don't want to care about the cost but still when you say it of course then you want to know is there any measurements for this so i move on to the next question from someone in the audience uh, the key car renders did the shadow catcher uh, mesh mimic the real world road or simply that floor flat floor sorry yeah so so the shadow catcher is basically transparent other than the shadows. So what it does is we, we can still see the back plate. So it's kind of uh, transparent other than shadows. And then you can comp them shadows over the top. Um, so really handy when you're doing shots like that. Mm. And also, since you mentioned that uh, you want to be the creative person, but still you have time limits. And of course, I can guess when you're working, sometimes you get very stressful to just produce a certain time. So how, how, do you, how do you cope with that? I think that optimizing the workflow, I really enjoy kind of writing scripts and trying to speed up some of the repetitive tasks. And obviously using tech, that can be really well, I say easy, but it's a benefit of using technology is that we can automate a lot of tasks and things such as having that material library saves tons of time, uh, light mix saves tons of time. So really optimizing this workflow and just allowing us to be creative is um, is a great thing. So I'm, I'm really happy with some of these uh, improvements from V-Ray as well. And why would you say that you're a successful creative person when it comes to this? What's the strength? Oh, I'm, I, I think it's um, being surrounded by really, really good designers, being given opportunities and um, yeah, just, just trying my best with, uh, with the opportunities oh. I get given. And also when you moved on to do trainings, uh, what, 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 what was the, why did you choose that lane? I mean, you could either be the creative person just behind the screen, as you said, look down and just work with that. But yeah, then sure. you did. I um I really enjoy, as I said, like optimizing these workflows. And I remember what it was like starting out, and it was it was different. We didn't have a lot of video tutorials, um, and there was a, there was a few online tutorials to follow, but it was all quite bitty. Mm -hmm. And I remember struggling quite a lot in the beginning. We had these black and white textbooks, like really thick, and trying mm -hmm. to uh, create images from a textbook by by reading. Mm. Uh, for it was just a real struggle for me and then as soon as video came along it kind of become a no-brainer to start creating videos I actually started a blog when I was at university and was kind of documenting the journey and any tutorials I found and any useful things 
Um, so you can kind of look on there and see the whole, the last, I don't even want to say how many years, but like the whole progression of, of some of these tutorials that at the beginning weren't very good and they were written as well. <laughs> well, if, uh, since we moved on to doing this online because of the Corona year, could you say, tell us something about how Corona might have been affected you or your work? Well, I think um, I've actually seen, yeah, initially there was a drop in work, but um, people are moving to CGI, especially product shots, product catalogs, furniture, um, fashion, all of these things are moving online and they need to move their whole catalogs online. So doing a CGI shoot, as I, as I said, is probably more cost effective than trying to photograph every single variation of every product you have. So I do, and I, and I see a lot more um, music videos and things moving to CGI. I don't know whether that is because people can't do physical shoots as much anymore. Mm. But I mean, CGI is, if you're involved in this industry, I, I really see it mm. um, being a really excited place to be in the next few years. Yeah, and I believe that the industry, even if it could be more cost when it comes to Corona, still we watch even more film. We mm -hmm. do streaming. I would say the only threat to streaming is when we sleep. So, uh, well, I do have another question for you. Was the print campaign successful for Grundig? Yeah, um, I believe it was. I don't have any of the figures um, from it. But I've I've worked with Bridget again quite a lot after that, so I would consider it a success. I was really happy with the results as well, mm. um, and even doing projects like that, big, quite long projects, it develops my workflow as well, and then I can implement that. And just you know, every project you get better and better, so it was mm. a really nice project to do. And what is a long project to you? Um, a long project. Well, I mean, when I was doing the yachts, the, the yacht you saw, I was with those guys for nearly four years um, from getting into studio, first renders, and then to see the boat finally hit the water. So I guess that was the longest project. <laughs> okay, it's a good experience. Yeah. Uh, and another question, uh, any upcoming project, Jakes? Or do you have to kill me if I ask you? It's a secret. Yeah, I don't. There's a few, <laughs> but we're just waiting for sign off. Um, <laughs> some exciting stuff. Uh, but I, I'm going to be working on updating a lot of the cool stuff um, for my teaching with some of the latest software. I mean, something that I really enjoy about teaching is that it's constantly changing. I mean, there's so much to learn every month and you've got software updates. So what's great about teaching is I have to keep on top of it and then I can show everyone else. So it keeps me on my toes as well. Mm. Great. And uh, do you have uh, your own, um, uh, have you been working abroad or, or are you always at your own site when working with CDIs it's, it's online? No, I mean, before I was in London, yeah. uh, I'm currently in Cambridge. I was in London before um, and I went in-house for an architect over there. And before that, I was in Bali traveling for a couple of years with my laptop, but working uh, using Chaos Cloud to render. Mm -hmm. And I mean, with, with the way things are going, we can render in the cloud and you can log into remote desktops. So there was no reason that you couldn't kind of um, travel around unless you need to be in-house. Mm -hmm. And have you come across the uh, film or production, film production incentives when it comes to shooting in different countries? I haven't, no. No, okay. So as an executive producer, I can tell you that uh, Sweden and Denmark and Luxembourg still don't have the film production incentives in Europe. And uh, well, the question is more like, if you do have the incentives, you will attract more people to come to your country and, and do the filming. But uh, mm -hmm. that might not be the case discussing together with you. But I just wanted to say that it's a really important question. And uh, yeah. even if we don't have it in Sweden, all the politician thinks that if you add it on, you could actually neutralize the system. So it won't be as many that will come because everyone else already got the film production incentives. Mm -hmm. Any comments? I don't, I'm not. <laughs> You're the wrong that person. Side of things, sorry. <laughs> It's like when you're asking me, what's the 3D in this picture? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, well, should we do a roundup? Uh, I don't have any more question or do you want to add? I something? think uh, there's one more question I can see yeah. here, which is yeah. um, what is the best reason to upgrade to the latest version? Yeah. I'm presuming of V-Ray. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely say, I mean, light mix has, has massively changed to help optimize my workflow. The material library is massive um, and there's tons of great other features. Um, there's some new maps to help create materials that um, are well worth checking out. It's also, I think I'm pronouncing this right, stochastic tiling, which mm -hmm. enables um, maps to not look tiled. And that's well worth checking out. That's in the UVW randomizer map. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there's quite a lot of small things that you that don't sound that important, but have really helped speed up the workflow. Mm. And more cost effective, who knows? <laughs> okay, thank you, Jake. I'm really happy that met you at least this way rather than being alive. But I hope, hope we can meet in the real life as well someday. I'm sure we will. So so uh, to round up this Q&A, uh, thank you for listening. Stay tuned and we will come back this afternoon at 2 p.m. And I hope to meet you all again. And a million thanks to you, Jake. Thanks very much for having me.